Okay, so this is Unit 7, Day 2 Notes. And this is where the real world application comes together and ideas that you should be thinking about as you're doing optimization should include first derivative test, candidates test, so first derivative test, candidates test, and then finally there's going to be some kind of feel to it as far as related rates. And some of you are probably thinking, oh God, here we go again. Well, related rates was difficult the first time because it was new to you, but now that you have some experience under your belt, I promise you, um, you will do better as far as being able to recall or um, familiarize yourself with the concepts that we will tie in together, that tie all these three concepts together in this part as far as optimization goes, okay? So don't worry, it will seem a little bit um, difficult at first, but you will, I guarantee you, acclimate um, to it a lot faster than what you did when you did related rates for the first time. All right, so let's go ahead and begin. So optimization, <clears throat> the big concept of optimization includes the following. So if a particle moves along the x-axis so that its position is given by this function, and it's saying between 0 and 4 seconds or units of time. And I want to find the minimum velocity. Okay, we did begin, we had a little precursor this morning in regards to um, what we did in, in, in class as far as trying to maximize or minimize something. Okay, so if I were to take it to a real world example, you're basically trying to maximize or minimize something that you would want to do in, in real life. For instance, if I would want to minimize cost, okay, and if I would want to maximize potential profit, okay, so you're going to see that in this unit you can also maximize other things, and we'll talk about them um, here at the end of this video, but this these are the overlying um, concepts or ideas that I want you to familiarize yourself with immediately. Okay, so there are two methods that you can do this. You can either maximize or minimize by using the candidates test or you can do the second method which is just basically using first derivative um, test knowledge where you can maximize or minimize um, functions where you're trying to find the relative max or the relative min. Most often than not this would probably be your first go-to but if it doesn't work out, you would have to um, revert back to the first method as far as being candidates test, okay? Okay, so it's not called first method because you're supposed to use it first. Don't think of it that way. It's just the first type of thing that you can use, first um, strategy, if you will. Okay, so our question says, first find um, the velocity. So my example was here. And I'm going to find the velocity, and the reason of it being is, is my goal is to maximize velocity. So if I want to maximize velocity, I need to first find the velocity, okay? So now that I've um, established what it is that I'm trying to minimize, I'm going to then take its derivative. So let's say that I wanted to minimize profit, and I called it P. If I want to minimize profit, um, I would have to take its derivative, okay? If I want to minimize area, I would have to take its derivative, so a prime of x. So in this case, since I'm minimizing uh, the velocity, I need to ultimately get to this function right here, the acceleration function, which is the derivative of the velocity. Now we had to derive from the original equation twice, but we ended up getting to this acceleration function of 16 minus 10. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to set it equal to zero and we're going to find the critical values. These critical points, the one, the only one that it's equal to is setting it equal to zero. You'd have 16 minus 10 is equal to zero. Oops. And then you just move stuff over and you know what to do from here. It's just 10 over 6. Otherwise, t is equal to 5 thirds. Okay. So the minimum velocity may occur at 5 thirds, which I just found, or because it's the candidates test, at either endpoint. Now, recall way up here we were given between 0 and 4. So my endpoints are going to be 0, 4. Okay? So your justification when it comes to candidates test is this chart right here. This is your justification in the regards to the work and what um, is enough 
words, if you will, as far as showing work, that says, you know, your answer is enough. Okay, so we have zero, five thirds, and four listed out as candidates. And when I want to maximize it, one thing that I want you to understand is that you're getting these critical values from the derivative. However, when you go to plug it in, you're not plugging it into the derivative, you're plugging it into the actual function that you're trying to see. What is the max or min? So we've been doing first derivative tests for a while. I just don't want you plugging in in uh, mistakenly in v prime of t. You need to go back one level up and actually plug in the critical values that you found into the position function if you will. And the position function in this case is interpreted as the velocity function itself. So when I plug it in, I would plug in 0 into this function right here, 3t squared minus 10t plus 12 and I'd get 12. Plug it in 5 thirds you get the following 3.667 and then for you would get 20. These are actual values, y values or outputs, meaning those are the velocities. So the minimum velocity, just comparing all these, is obviously going to be this 3.667 and it occurs when t is equal to 5 thirds. Okay? So in this case, it doesn't give you units, it doesn't give you meters per second, but you could just say at 5 thirds units. That's, that's the way I would like for you to do it as far as the test goes if you are not given units. Okay, so some people might think that's a lot of work. You know, you need to check with the candidates test. You got to go back to the original function, just like I'm listing and writing out here. You know, it, it seems like a lot. It would be easier, some people would say, is if we just use first derivative knowledge and do sine interval tests. So sine tests with these intervals as far as can I find a relative max or min? Okay, so if I were to use this method, now it's the same problem, okay, my velocity is still what we found up above, and my V prime is still 16 minus 10, so that my critical number is still 5 thirds. Well, here's the thing. The reason why I have 0 and 4 over here in blue is the fact that they were my endpoints that were first given. So what I'm trying to see is within 0 to 5 thirds, what is the sign? Okay, so zero to five thirds, five thirds is about one and some change, so a little bit over one. So if I chose one as my test point and I plugged it into the derivative, so we're looking at v prime of t, okay, again, just to reiterate, I'm trying to maximize v of t. So when I take its derivative, I get my critical point from it and now I'm going to do sine tests with the derivative function. Okay, So I'll, let's try 1. So 1 lies about somewhere right here. And I'm going to plug it into this equation so that I get a negative. Okay, So if I choose something above 5 thirds, something like we could even say 3 or 2, it doesn't matter as long as it's above 5 thirds. Let's try 2. We would get 12 minus 10, you get a positive. Right here, her first derivative test, this is showing negative to positive change with the derivative is going to be a relative minimum. Okay, So the minimum will occur at 3.667, which is that 5 thirds. Um, whoops. It will occur at 5 thirds. So there's your at value. And the actual minimum velocity is 3.667. Okay. So the only thing that is a little bit different that you have to um, further do as far as show work is yes, up until now we've found, okay, the relative max occurs at 5 thirds because f prime of x changes from negative to positive. In this case it's relative min so that's why it's mentioned as negative to positive. Okay. But further what we have to do is take that 5 thirds and actually plug it into my velocity graph. Okay. And plug it into the velocity graph will yield this value of 3.667. So it's a little similar to candidates, it's just less work in the end. And you'll see when we do our examples. Okay, so a particle moves along the x-axis so that its position function is given by the following. Again, we're going to do, this is my position function and this is my time. But this time I want to look for the maximum, not the minimum. Okay. Just the work that we did, if we're trying to maximize velocity, I'm going to obtain my velocity function. I'm going to then take the derivative, just like I did in the last slide, so I get 16 minus 10, 
We know that this is t is equal to 5 thirds. And if I was going to try to use that first derivative sign test, I'd have v prime of t. Here's 5 thirds. And we know it's going to be negative to positive, thus showing a relative min. Well, here's the thing. We're trying to maximize the velocity. So because of that, we know we cannot use this because the only thing that this shows is a relative min, not a relative max. So it shows this decreasing to increasing. So there's not, it's not going to be maximized as far as ve uh, velocity here at 5 thirds. It could be at the end point of 0, or it could be at the end point of 4. So, so the graph could look something like this. Or the graph could decrease to 5 thirds and then increase a little bit but still increase, and the max could occur at zero. So the max could occur at zero, or the max could occur at four, okay? As far as timeline-wise, seconds, if you will. So we're looking at zero here, and there could be a max. We'll have to use the candidates test, which, you know, you, we just went through it as far as how we obtain these values, and that's how we'll understand to interpret 20 is the velocity and 20 units per time is probably what I would want you to it is what I would want you to do units per time if you're not given meters seconds or any kind of units okay and it's occurring when t is equal to 4 units in this case because of the fact again they don't list seconds or meters or anything like that okay so understand the difference this will show certain criteria, but if it's not showing what you're looking for, i.e. this maximum, okay, you're going to have to resort to the candidates test. And the candidates test will work. It will give you an answer because it's including those other critical points of the endpoints themselves. Okay, so now let's get to it. This is our first example, and the example shows that a swimmer is two miles in the ocean. So imagine yourself, you're right here and you're in the ocean and right here is basically the shoreline okay and there's a town over here okay so you're the green dot and it says the swimmer is two miles in the ocean and wishes to get to a town three miles down the coast so three miles down the coast you're to interpret this as being this this is three miles down the coast okay and it, of course, it's assuming that this is perpendicular. So if you were to go straight to the shore, it would be straight 90 degree if it was perpendicular to the shore. Okay? So the swimmer needs to swim to the shore and then walk to the point, um, or sorry, and then walk along the shore so where that they would um, ultimately get to the town. Okay? So the swimmer is going to swim to the shore and then walk along the sh shore so that ultimately he will get to the town. Okay, so if I were to highlight it, let me highlight it in green. This is the swimmer's path until he gets or she gets to the town. Now, looking at this, it says, okay, he, he can swim at two miles per hour. So this two miles per hour is specifically telling me that it's the velocity or the rate at which he is swimming. Okay, the four miles per hour is the rate at he, which he would be walking. Okay, so there's two different rates accounting for that um, path that he's taking as far as the swimming and the walking. So now it says, to what point should the swimmer along the shoreline, okay, and this shoreline is all this that I highlighted originally, um, should he swim to so that basically whenever he starts to walk, it's going to minimize time. So it says, to what point should he swim along the shoreline so that the time it takes to get to the town is a minimum? Okay, so we're ultimately trying to find x. And if you see the way I've labeled this, I've labeled, let me uh, take off a little bit of the highlight. I've labeled, oops, I've labeled this piece right here as x which means the entire piece that's left over will be 3 minus x because again this entire distance is 3 miles okay so if that is x and that is 3 minus x I can create a Pythagorean uh, or sorry uh, um, yeah Pythagorean theorem x squared plus 2 squared 
take the square root of it, and that's going to be c squared. And c squared is, what is this path that um, he's going to take as he is swimming? Okay? And then finally, the 3 minus, 3 minus x will be the leftover path. Okay? So basically, we have to come up with an equation, and this is where it kind of gets a little bit involved with, it feels like related rates to an extent. Okay, so watch what I did. D is the total distance. Okay, so D is uh, accounting for the total distance that's covered both swimming and walking. T is the total time. Now, an equation that we should know, okay, in the, in the regards of relating time and distance and rate is D is equal to RT. Okay, the reason why I chose to get T by itself is the fact that I'm trying to minimize the time. So I need to come up with an equation that is incorporating times. Okay, so that's why I chose to, it, it feels like a form of proportions to where, like what we did when we were doing inverted cones, like a, a tank of uh, water in an in a inverted cone is leaking, and we did like the, the ratio between the radius and the height, and we were trying to write it in terms of something specifically as far as one variable. That's what they, this kind of feels like. So I'm trying to get this, um, these quantities written in terms of time. Again, because I'm trying to minimize time. All right. So what is the distance that it's going to cover? Well, the distance that we have over here, this first distance is 2 squared plus x squared, which is simply 4 plus x squared, taking the square root. And then the leftover distance would be adding this 3 minus x. Okay, the reason why I chose to do those parentheses is because sometimes this right here could be a negative, and I want to make sure that I remember to distribute, okay? So obviously it's not needed for this one. We can write it like the following. I'm going to write it and basically change the distance now. I'm going to change the distance to uh, an equation that's involving time. And how do I do that? Well. If I highlight it in green, these are still representing distances. Okay? And on the denominator, 2 was the rate at which he was swimming, 4 was the rate at which he was walking. Okay? Those are representing the rates here. So it's ultimately time or t of x is equal to time 1 plus time 2. And they're all they're both written in terms of x. Okay? So this was my Basically, first goal is trying to see what is the equation that I'm going to maximize or minimize. Because once I do that, my first go-to is first derivative test. Okay? So, what I'm going to show you right now is how we can put this in the calculator so that it finds it very quickly for us. Because I do not want to do this by hand. You see the square roots. You see that there's fractions. There's a lot of constant multiple rule. You would definitely not want to do quotient rule. Because you could GC or you could, uh, sorry, um, constant multiple rule out like one half and one fourth from each of these fractions. Let me go ahead and pull up the calculator and show you how you should um, do it quickly. Okay, so let's go to the calculator. So grab a new document, no save changes, grab a calculator, and we're going to start putting in my t of x function. So it's square root of 4 plus x squared. So it's going to be a fraction, whoops. So control divide. And on the top it's the square root. Let me fix that. Control divide. On the top it's the square root of four plus x squared. And on the bottom it's the rate, which is two. And then it's going to be plus another fraction. And it's going to be x minus three. Oh, sorry, 3 minus x. Very, very important. 3 minus x, and then it's over 4. Okay? So what I've done is I've established that I'm going to now store it by pressing Control Store, and I'm going to store it as t of x, is what I wrote back there. So t of x is my function notation. Oops, I just realized something. Let me come back over here. Um, store it accidentally put t of x. Oh, no, no, I did it right. What am I talking about? t of x. 
Okay, so it's stored as t of x. So what I'm going to do now is immediately I know that because I'm wanting to minimize or maximize, I'm going to take the derivative. So right here is taking the derivative. This is how you put it into the calculator. I'm going to solve basically for the critical points by setting it equal to zero, but I'm going to use the calculator, okay? So looking at it, what you see here, it's going to be the solve feature. So it's going to be menu 3, 1, and it's going to be the derivative of t of x, okay? So the derivative button can be located next to 9. This is the first derivative here because that's what we're taking. And then it's going to be with respect to x because I made my variable x. And the function that I'm wanting to do that I stored is t of x. So I'll say t of x. Now I will kick out once so that I can set that derivative equal to 0. And I'll do comma x and then close. Now I'll control enter and this 1.14. 547 is exactly what I have here. This is a critical point. This is the only critical point. So what we've been doing with critical points, we do that first derivative, we do a sign test as far as putting it um, on the linear representation. We are about to do sign tests here in just a bit and you'll see that I'm going to end up obtaining a relative min. Okay, so let me show you what I did. I chose to use two test points, okay? Something to the left of 1.1547, so I chose one, and then something to the right, choose two. So if I looked at this and I were trying to see what is, what is the sign, how can I obtain these signs to actually show this negative and positive that I already have written, well, how did I obtain those negative and positives with the calculator quickly? Well, this is how I did it. If I go back to the calculator and I want to find the, the slope at a point, menu 4 for calculus, derivative at a point, my variable is x, and if you remember, the first one that I wanted to try and test point was 1. So because it's the first derivative, I'll leave it at first derivative, I'll press OK, and this is how it pops up. Now I'll say t of x, Okay, not t of 1, okay, because then it's trying to evaluate the time bef and, and then deriving rather than deriving first and then plugging in your at value, in this case being 1. So this is how we're going to do it, and you see that we get a negative. So it doesn't matter what number it is, just negative. It basically um, shows you that it's going to be decreasing as far as time there. So going back, I can quickly copy by just pressing up twice and pressing enter. And now I can try 2, which is my other test point. Whoops. Let me control enter so that you can see it as a decimal. It's still a positive, And that's how we obtain this positive over here. We know from last unit, unit 6, with first derivative tests, relative max and mins, that this is going to be a relative min. With that being said, because it satisfied what I was looking for, I don't have to look at the endpoints. There, you know what I mean? As in regards to, if I'm decreasing to increasing, it doesn't matter what the endpoints are because they're going to be above where that 1.1547 value would yield. Okay? So at the very end, I have down here, per first derivative test, minimum time will occur at x is equal to 1.155 because I went ahead and rounded it. And in this case we have, let's see, what do we have? We have miles per hour. So you can say miles per hour, it's going to be 1.15 hours. So at 1.155 hours, or meaning 1.845, okay, so it will occur at 1.155 hours. Again, x is representing my variable as far as time, okay? So I just realized, and I'm glad I caught it now because I'm sure someone would have caught it and emailed me. x, what we let x to be, was not the actual time. x that we assigned it way up here was the distance away from as far as at what point should he swim along the shore. Okay, so what point 
that x value is 1.155, and this would be um, miles. Okay, so this is 1.155 miles, and 3 minus 1.155 miles would yield the fact that I could also interpret it as 1.845 miles from the town. So meaning that this distance right here could be 1.845 miles. Okay, so when he says, when they ask to what point, you can say either at x equals 1.155 miles, or you could say the equivalent uh, of that as far as 1.845 miles away from the town. Either one would work. And you're going to say because t prime of x changes from negative to positive, that yields that relative minimum. Okay. So if x is equal to 1.55 is plugged into the time, okay, that's what I have over here. If I went ahead and went further and plugged it in, I would get the time that it would take would be about 1.616 hours. And what did I do? I plugged in my x, which was my input variable, into my t of x function. Everywhere where I saw an x, I plugged it in. Not to the derivative function, but into the position function itself. So if I went over there and said, all right, well, let me try this out. I want to put 1.154700, and I want to put it into the t function. All I need to do, because I have t of x stored, is do t of that 1.55, which is way up here, 1.1547. Okay? And then I can press control enter and it'll give me that value of 1.616, which is what we got over here. Okay? So I'm using that stored position function in many ways to find its derivative and the critical points with a calculator aid, but also to find its actual value in regards to what it represents, in this case time. Okay, so if you do need to rewind this video, by all means do so. I know it's your first one. All right, so let's move on. Next example says, find the dimensions of a 12 ounce can that can be constructed with the least amount of metal. So if you're thinking about a can, the least amount of metal, you should be thinking, I'm needing to minimize the surface area, not the volume. I'm talking about the actual material itself. So it's going to minimize the surface area. And let's assign surface area with the variable of s. Okay? So what else am I given? When I'm, I'm given the fact that 12 ounces is equal to 355 milliliters, or better yet, 355 cubic centimeters. So and I'm going to justify my answer. Again, I'm trying to minimize the surface area. And the surface area formula is given right here. If you haven't already uh, figured it out, pi r squared are the bases. Two, because I have a top and I have a bottom to this can. And then the two pi r h is basically the um, surface area of the outer uh, part of the can. Okay, So the, the, the way to remember this is two pi r is the circumference of a circle. And when I multiply it by height, it's like I'm stacking quarters, if you will. That gives me the surface area of the side of the can. Okay, so I just figured out that ultimately I'm trying to minimize this equation right here. Now, what I want you thinking at this point in time is S is written in terms of R and H. When we're trying to take derivatives, I don't want it written in terms of more than one variable. I want it written in terms of one variable. And this is what we did when we were doing related rates, again, with that example of the inverted cone and the proportion. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use what they told me that was the volume. The volume equation for this they've also given us is pi r squared times h. So all I did was set 355 equal to pi r squared h. So if I put 355 over here as the actual number that represents the volume and then solve for h by getting it by itself, I'm just dividing by pi r squared. Okay? 
And you're going to see that I'm going to use this now to substitute. And I'm going to put it right over here where this H is, is uh, lying as far as so that everything is written in terms of only one variable. Now I'm ready to derive. Okay? So ultimately, all this is my position function. A good thing that you might want to do that many of you have been doing is simplify. Okay, so simplifying, the pi's would cancel out, and one of the r's would cancel out, so that you would get 2 times 355, so 710 over r is what that piece reduces to. So this is what I'm going to end up putting in my calculator and storing it because I'm going to use it. Okay, so 2 pi r squared, let me come over here. So we're going to say, we go 2 pi r squared, and it's going to be plus 710 over r. Okay, so plus the fraction 710 over r. And when I press enter, I'm going to store it as s of r. Okay, so let's control store as s of r. And then we'll close and then we'll press enter and now it's stored. Okay, so now since I'm trying to minimize this surface area, I'm going to immediately take its derivative and then do some test points. My first go-to is going to be that um, first derivative test. Okay, So look at the work that I have over here. Let me highlight it in purple. The work that I have over here is ultimately we're trying to find when does the derivative equal zero. Okay, So again, here's my work right here. I'm going to put the solve feature I'm going to put it the derivative of that position function, which in this case is that s of r. Set it equal to zero and then comma r because I'm trying to find that critical point. Okay, so here we go. So the steps are menu 3, 1, and then it'd be that uh, key next to 9. I'm going to select the derivative. It is in respect to r in this case, so my variable needs to be r, and it's going to be s of r. Okay. So s of r is my function that I stored. Kick out just one parenthesis so that I can set it equal to zero, and then comma r, and then close. Control enter gives me 3.837. And 3.837 is what I have right here. Okay? That is my critical point. I'm going to go, I'm going to do a sign test with that in mind. Again, this is the s prime of r. And then I'm just going to test numbers just to the left and just to the right. So I chose 3 and I chose 4. So let's find the derivative at these points. So menu, 4, 2. My variable is r. My value is 3. I am doing one derivative from what I have stored. My uh, function is s of r. And then when I press control enter, you see that it's going to be a negative. It doesn't matter that it's 41. The fact that it's negative shows that I was ultimately trying to see uh, what what it's doing. Is it increasing or decreasing? In this case, it's decreasing. Okay. So when I go back to it, I can just quickly go up and this time delete and change that to 4 so that I can see, whoops, let me control enter, that it's going to be a positive. Okay. So it's going to be a positive there. Well, I know from first derivative test that's a relative min. And what were we trying to do? We were trying to minimize it. So it worked out. So I don't have to use a candidate's test. So I'll say final answer is right here. Per first derivative test, the dimensions of the minimal amount of metal are the following right here. R is equal to 3.837 centimeters. And that's what we got as far as my critical number. Remembering that R was my um, input variable that we chose to use for my surface area. Okay, so with that being said, R is the critical point that we found, 3.837. How do we find H? Well, we go back and we plug it in. We plug it into what we wrote H in terms of R. So plugging in 3.8 right here for this R is going to yield the value of 7.674. Now, something that I want to tell you right now that 3.837. It's not the value that I want to plug in just like that. I want to go as exact as possible, not using the rounded answer. So when I plug that in, 
I'm basically going to say 355 over pi r squared. So I'll come over here. So I'll say 355 over pi. And it's going to be something squared. Okay. So let me put a parenthesis and I'm going to go up and I'm going to grab that this number which is a little bit more exact than what I rounded it to as far as that goes. So when I press enter you see how exact it is. All these come into play as far as the value. So let me see real quick. So 355. Um, I didn't mean to do it like that but I'll go ahead and type it in. 3.8 and when you're working through the problem you can do six decimals. That's quite enough. So 3.8 Three seven two one five, and that is r, and it's going to be squared. Now let me come up to the numerator because I accidentally put it there where it should have been just three five five. Now, whenever I press Control Enter, you see how I got that seven six um, seven four. Okay, so basically, I'm just trying to show you by calculator practice. I'm not using the rounded answer to obtain the h. I used a six decimal more exact answer and then rounded the answer thereafter to three decimal places. Okay, and you see that the, because s prime of r changes from negative to positive, thus there's your relative myth. Okay, so let's move on to another example. All right, so this one, it says the sum of the perimeter of a square. So when you see these prepositions of the perimeter of a square, and the surface, or, or sorry, and the circumference of a circle is 20. Okay, so the sum, there's that, of the perimeter of the square, there's that, and the circumference of the circle, there's that, is or equals 20. So 4s plus 2 pi r is equal to 20 is where I'm going to start off at. It says find the dimensions of the square and the circle that produce the minimum area. Okay, so my goal is I need to establish an area function. Okay, so let's look at the area function over here. We know we have to minimize it. The area function is going to be s squared. Okay, it's not what it gave us up here. Okay, this gave us the perimeter. What we have to establish is this guy right here. So the area is side squared because that's the area of a square plus pi r squared because that's the area of a circle. So these two are areas in their own right. Okay, The sum of them is what we're trying to minimize. All right. So looking at this, if I know I'm going to minimize a, I know I have to put a in terms of one variable and right now it's in terms of two. It's in terms of s and r. So I need to do one or the other. Okay. So if I solve for s in this equation, Okay, and let's go back all the way to this equation over here. This 4s plus 2, um, right here, plus 2 pi r is equal to 20. I basically can come up with two equations. Okay, I can solve for s by getting it all by itself, and I would get this. Or with this equation, again, that I have way up here, 4s plus 2 pi r is equal to 20, I can solve for r. And trying to get r by itself, I would come up with this equation. So what is it that I'm going to do? Well, I know that I have both of them in terms of the other. So what I ultimately did is I used, let me highlight it so you can see it, this s value and I put it here. Basically, I'm writing everything in terms of r. That's what I chose to do. You can write it in terms of s and still get the answers, it's just going to be the um, um, same process, you're just assigning an input variable to s rather than r. Okay. So a of r, a of r is the area in terms of r being the input. So r is, in this case, r is going to be my um, radius. Okay. So ultimately what I'm trying to do is minimize this established function that I just came up with. All of it is in terms of r. So you're seeing right now, this is a nightmare to do if you're trying to do this by hand. So more than likely, these types of questions will be calculator questions. It's just you need to see and read and interpret and decipher what is it that you're going to establish as your 
equation that you're going to, to derive. Okay, so let's go ahead and assign a of r into the calculator. We'll come over here and we'll put all of that is going to be squared. So we'll say parentheses fraction. And it's going to be 20 minus 2 pi r. So 20 minus 2 pi r. Oops. Pi r. And it's going to be over 4. Okay, so 4 will go down here. And then when I close it, I'll square the whole thing. Then I'm going to add pi r squared. So I'll say plus pi r squared. Okay, so this is stored. Now, who cares what that looks like? It's going to be stored as A of R. So, control store. We'll say A of R. And it's done. Now, we've just stored it as A of R. Well, what are we going to do since we're minimizing it? Well, we're going to take the derivative. And that's what you see right here. I'm going to solve for the derivative whenever it's equal to zero, the critical points, if you will. And you see, I should get a critical point of r is equal to 1.400 and some change. So let's let's take a look and make sure that that is correct. So over here, menu 3, 1, the derivative key, my input value uh, variable is r, and my established function that we just assigned was a of r. We want to find when this derivative is set equal to zero, so let me move one over. Okay, if you don't move one over and you try to put it on the inside, it's going to say when the position function is equal to r, or sorry, when it's equal to zero, and it's a little bit different. Like, it's not going to it's not going to work correctly. So don't put zero here because it would be wrong. Okay, so you want to make sure that you know the notation of the calculator that the derivative. Let me use the highlighter so you see what I'm talking about. The derivative right here. Um, let me see. Let me see. Take that off real quick. The derivative that you see, this guy right here, is taking the derivative of whatever's in those two parentheses. So those two parentheses, let me make it a little bit smaller so you can see exactly what I'm showing you. These parentheses is where the function is going to go inside. So that's what I'm saying. Be careful as far as where you're going to put that equal zero at. Okay? Alright, so going back over here, we're going to put it over here, we're going to set it equal to zero, and then we're trying to solve for r. Control enter and you get the 1.40025. Now, if I want to come up here and press it again and you see it more exact, you can do that. And I should, probably should have done that on the last one just so that I know to six decimal places what am I going to be using as I go through the problem for other pieces. Okay? So you see 1.400 right here is my critical point. Okay? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to do test points. And you see them right here, let me highlight it, you see the test points that I've chosen to use are 1 and 2 because they're just to the left and just to the right of that 1.4. Okay, so let's see what we did. I did the first derivative by doing menu 4 derivative at a point. Again, I'm just trying to get the signs from this. My input is r. My value was 1. It was the first derivative and it was of a of r. And then we pressed enter, and we got a negative value. Okay, So you see the negative written here. And you can show your work like this if you want. Then I tried two. So this one's quick. I could just go up, delete that one, and say I want to look at it when it's two. Control enter. It's positive. Okay, So we go, and we see that positive is shown there as far as written. So if it's negative to positive, that's going to be a relative min. We were trying to minimize area, so this uh, method work. And again, if you recall back at the beginning of this video, it's the second method. But we're going to call it for the first derivative test, minimal area because a prime of r changes from negative to positive. When r is equal to this, and notice how I've already rounded to three decimal places, and then s is equal to this. So let's think about it. How did we get s? Well, if I know r, I can just plug it right here. If I plug it right there where I see this r, I can ultimately obtain the s. And the value that I plugged in was not 1.400. The value that I plugged in was this uh, 1.400247, or 248 in this case, because I was trying to get it to six decimal places. So let me show you that real quick. So 20 minus 2 by r, 
20 minus 2 pi, and then r, let me do parentheses, is going to be this number right here to six decimal places, which is going to be right there. So I'm going to put, let me come back down, 1.412, and then 248, 248. And then I'll close, and on the bottom, if I go back to the equation, I had a 4. Okay? And then when I press Control Enter, that's when you see the 2.8, whoops, the 2.8005. You can either round or truncate it. I chose to truncate it, not sure why, but I got 2.800. Or you could put 2.801 if you chose to round it. Okay? Always, always, always round at the very end or truncate at the very end. All right. So let's look at this one. I believe we have a couple more. Yeah, we have two more problems. And then you will have the notes for this part. The sum of the perimeter of a square and the circumference is 20. So this is the same one, only this time this is part B. I want to find the dimensions that will produce the maximum area. Now, if I were to go back, we just saw that this was a relative min. We cannot take 1.400 because it's not important. It's, it doesn't show that it's a relative max. We're trying to maximize the area this time. Okay. So if you look at this, I'm going to end up, here's the 1.400. I'm going to end up having to do a little bit something a little bit different in the fact of trying to use the candidates test. Okay, so the candidates test is what I'm going to use. Ultimately, I'm trying to maximize the area. Notice the table that I created. I created it with R, okay, and that's that um, radius of the circumference, or sorry, the radius of the circle, and then I used the S, which was that side of the square. I'm trying to find the dimensions that have the maximum area. So I need to come up with a with an area formula that I used from before, but what I need to think of more so is the fact that we know the first derivative test didn't work because it shows a relative min instead of a relative max. But I need to come up with what are these numbers going to be as far as my endpoints. Okay, so when I take the sum of those two shapes. I need to go a little bit to the extremes of those two shapes. Okay, the extremes meaning I could say the radius of the circle is zero. And if the radius of the circle is zero, then it has to be that this side is going to be um, five because the perimeter of this square would be four times each side. Okay, so four sides added up together would be 4s. So 4s would be an area, sorry, um, I'm thinking uh, perimeter right now. I need to be thinking of an area. So if the side is 5, when I square it, the area would equal 25. So it's side squared, which would be 5 squared is 25. Now, the other extreme is not when r is equal to 0. The other extreme would be when s is equal to 0. So let me go ahead and keep that there. And here's the other extreme. So this one's a little bit extend a little bit of an extension from what we've done so far because I got to think a little bit out of the box in the regards of what are their um, outer limits what are the endpoints that are included in this real world problem so again when the radius is zero or when the side is zero those will show me my extremes now where did I get this 10 over pi all I did to solve r is equal to 10 over pi is if I set s is equal to zero Basically, what I'm left with is 20 minus 4 times 0. It's going to be 20 over 2 pi. 20 over 2 pi would reduce, oops, 20 over 2 pi would reduce to this 10 over pi. This is how I obtained 10 over pi. This might be a little tricky, even for uh, you guys that are getting this, as far as you will have to do it with practice to see how this is working out as far as these extremes that I've highlighted. Okay, so that yes, they do revolve around these two equations that I initiated um, on the last, on part A, as far as R or S, in, in terms of R or in terms of S. But now I have the two case scenarios. I have 0, I have two, uh, 10 over pi, 
and then I have the other one that I was finding. I have found all critical points. So ultimately what I want you to get from this is that when I set one equal to zero, that is an endpoint. When I set the other one equal to zero, it is an endpoint of interpretation. Now all I have to do is just plug all of them in and see what will the area be respectively whenever each one is written as you see it. So 0, 5, 25. The radius, it would be 2 pi r. So it would be 2 pi r. Okay, let me go back. So the area is going to be, where's my equation? I don't have it here. The area equation ended up being side squared. It's right here, side squared plus pi r squared. So side squared plus pi r squared. If I chose 10, uh, 10 over pi as my r, I would plug it in right here. If I chose 0, I would plug it in here for my s. This would yield a value of this. Now this set puzzle is a little bit long and I'm not going to show you with the calculator because I think I've shown you enough in that regard, but it would yield a 31.83, okay? Vice versa, if I now chose to do that last critical point of 1.400, using it as R, I'd put it here, then 2.8, I would put it for S, and I would put it here. And again, that 2.8 is what I ended up happening from part A. So this is actually a difficult problem, only even though it's worded with very few words, okay? Doing that, plugging these values here, um, oops, plugging these values R there, plugging these values S there, would yield an area of this. So this is using candidates test, and you can see that the maximum area will occur, well the maximum area basically is 31.831 units squared. And when does it occur? Well it occurs here. When the side is equal to zero units, and the radius is equal to 10 over pi units. So again, if you need to rewind this video, or this part of the video to see what's going on as far as producing this maximum area, please by all means do so. Make sure you put your justification, of course, as far as per candidate's test, okay? Last problem. Last problem shows a closed box with a square base. So you see the closed box. I've highlighted the square base. It's to be built so that its volume is 72 cubic centimeters, okay? Volume is length times width times height. But because this length and width are the same, we could just say x squared, okay? So v is equal to x squared times height. We are going to set it equal to 72. So it has, again, that feel of related rates with that inverted cone to it. Because you see right here that I just changed it in terms, or um, I wrote h in terms of x. So h is equal to 72 over x squared. Now, what is it that it's asking? It says if the bottom of the box, okay, so imagine this. This is a closed box, so yes, it does have a lid, it does have a top. Sometimes some of them won't, and you'll do it a slightly different in that regard. This one, it is a closed box. If the bottom of the box, now highlighted in gray, since I highlighted this bottom piece gray, costs 60 cents, and the sides, so we have all four sides, I'm just gonna highlight one of them. So you have the left, right, back and front, they cost 35 cents for each um, squared uh, centimeter squared. And the top, so let me highlight the top, for some reason, is a little bit cheaper than the bottom, probably as far as uh, strength in the box, if you will. So looking at it like this, the, box, the, the top of the box costs 30 cents for each uh, square centimeter. We're going to find the dimensions and the cost of the least expensive box. Now when you read least expensive box, you're trying to minimize something, okay? So minimize, and when we're saying least expensive, obviously what we're trying to say is to minimize the cost. Okay, I didn't say minimize the amount of box, of uh, the amount of material that I'm doing. That was another problem that we did earlier in this video. We're trying to minimize the cost. Okay, so here we go. First of all, the surface area is 
the bottom is x squared. That's the area of that bottom gray um, square. The sides are basically um, length times width, which in this case is x times um, h. There's four sides, so it'd be 4xh. And then finally, the top is again, similar to the bottom, x squared. The reason why I chose to write two x squareds is that one of them will have a cost of 60 cents. This is that bottom. The top will have a cost of 30 cents. So now I went from a surface area to a cost function by putting these coefficients, if you will, of the cost per each entity. So 60 cents x squared, 35 cents 4xh, and then 30 cents for that x squared. Okay. So this is what I'm trying to minimize, of course. You could do this as far as by hand, it's not too bad, but one thing that you want to recognize immediately is the fact that you don't have everything written in terms of one variable. I want ultimately to substitute 72 over x squared right there where you see it, okay? Now, because of time, because this is a little bit lengthy, I want to go ahead and just show you the process, but I won't actually show you through the calculator because it reflects what we've done before. We're going to solve, first of all, we would store this function of c of x into the calculator, written in terms of x, not h anymore, so that would be substituted. We would do the solve feature the way we've done on other problems. And you can see that it kind of becomes a little repetitive at this point, as far as once you've established your equation. I found a critical value of 3.825. It showed a relative min when I did the first derivative test. That is what I'm trying to do, create a minimum. So per first derivative test, the dimensions and cost can be calculated. Um, so here is my work, real quick. Here's my work that shows that negative and positive. And I'm going to say per first derivative test, dimensions and cost of the least expensive box are the following. Now, remember that this 3.825862 is reflecting the x value, okay? That was my input that I minimized. So x over here is 3.826. So what is x over here? x was the sides. It's all about the variables and how you assign them. So these are the sides of the basis. H if I plugged in 3.826 right here, where um, I have h written in terms of x, I can, of course, find the h part. Now, again, some of you are probably thinking, am I going to plug in 3.826, or do I plug in something more exact? Yes, you would plug in something more exact. It would be 3.826 and then three more numbers because you're doing it to six decimal places. Then, whatever you get after that, you would round that h value, and you should get 4.919. And then the cost itself. So what is it that you're going to put in the cost? Are you going to put the 3.826 or are you going to put the 4.919? Well, you're going to put the 3.826, but you're going to put it more exact. Again, six decimal places. Each piece or each part to um, the question you want to use as exact values until you get the final answer for that piece itself. Then in that piece, you would round. Well, in this case, we're not going to round to three decimal places because it's money. We would round to two decimal places, and the cost is ultimately 39.52. Now, you will have a CFA over this. I would suggest that you look over the supplemental homework that's in regards to this. Um, so it'll be a direct reflection of the uh, type of CFA that you had for day one's material. So please make sure you familiarize yourself with this because we will not only do the CFA, but we will have questions, a lot of questions in class for bonus point opportunities, group bonus point. All right, so that's all I have.